Hooray, the Chibnall era has dropped an episode that I'm pretty confident in calling a miss. Yes, finally. Where's my sledgehammer? Let's smash the fuck out of this shit. Aha, I knew you went into Doctor Who wanting to hate it, Stuart. Ah, fuck's sake. All right, you got me there. However much I dislike the Saranga conundrum, I'm grateful for it instilling a reaction in me that wasn't the bored indifference to mild compliments that I've had for the first four episodes, because however much I thought they were all right, I didn't exactly have a whole lot of fun writing about them. Thing is though, while I feel comfortable in calling the Saranga conundrum a definite clanger, the only problem is that it's not very interesting in its capacity as a clanger. I mean, I could pretty much just say the words show don't tell over and over again for seven to ten minutes and just call it a day. I like to think an alternate title for this episode is Doctor Who and the Extreme Case of Verbal Diarrhea. After a pretty decent cold open to get the Doctor and Co onto this hospital ship, it's pretty much non-stop exposition from then on, and it's very full on and just exhausting, frankly. Everyone explains so much stuff in such a short space of time that I found it hard to absorb any of it. I'm an old man now, Doctor Who. Now slow down so I can get it. Okay, so... There is a little monster on the ship that eats metal, and you need to stop it from eating the metal. Right, okay, follow-up question. Why does that require lots of pointless overwritten jabbering for pretty much every second of the runtime? Watching the Saranga conundrum is like going to your doctor and listening to them explain your illness. You have to listen to it, because, you know, you're ill, they're your doctor, but barely any of it's actually penetrating your brain because it's so dull and incomprehensible, and in the end you just come out and say, Okay, so basically, I take this pill and I'll get better. Yes. Hooray! Done! See ya! Saranga Conundrum is ultimately just another base under siege story, but the problem is that I can't even appreciate it on that level, because there's no real atmosphere and tension here. Because no one ever shuts the fuck up and just allows me to absorb what's going on properly. And the dialogue that is there that I could grab onto is very flat and just lifeless, and very open about it being there to fulfil a very basic function. Like, does anyone remember how the Tenth Doctor would always go up to a bit of technology and go, Oh, it's a something something blah blah space thing. Ah, nice. And it grated on me a bit after a while because of just how often he would do it, but at least they were trying to make blatant exposition sort of feel natural. In Saranga Conundrum, when you remove all the flabby word salad, it boils down to just, this is happening. How do we stop this thing from happening? By using this method. Okay, let's do that by using a, um... A false positive root signal to send back. Yeah, one of those. Whatever that is. I mean, I suppose it does kind of feel like semi-naturally dumped in exposition on occasion, but it's only really the energy and enthusiasm that Jodie brings to this role that did it and hooked me in. If you take her out of the equation, the veil of fiction is very thin. General Cicero, not Eve Cicero, keep a galaxy, neuropilot. You're mentioned in the Book of Celebrants. You helped defeat the army of the Eons at the Battle of the Underkind. Hello, other character. Let me explain who you are for the audience. I swear about 80% of this episode is techno babble when you break it down. The other 20% of course is for the moments of let's stop the episode and ask each other how we feel, which aren't quite as awkward and jerky as when Chris employed a similar technique in episodes like Power of Three, but they are still awkward and jerky. There's this bit here where Ryan tells the story of how his mum died, which is tragic and sad, but when I'm watching it, I'm just thinking, 10 minutes ago I was looking at a little CGI alien that eats metal. I understand that Chris probably wanted to get Ryan's absent parent backstory in there somewhere, but it's just sort of randomly dumped into the middle of the action, and I wouldn't have recommended doing it like this, because stopping the episode to paint a vivid picture with words of a kid finding their parent's dead body is a massive downer, and it breaks the flow of the episode. Getting onto the Pating, I think they're quite a nice idea. And I'll admit that when this doctor person said that something had breached the ship and we do the slow build to seeing what the alien looks like, yes, I was expecting a big and scary alien, but it turns out it's a small, cute alien. Oh my god, my expectations were subverted. Oh, surprise, fuck my brains out. Thing is though, it's not exactly doing much to set Saranga Conundrum apart from other spaceship based under siege type stories though, cause it's just going, you know how the monster is usually big and scary? Well this time, it's small and not scary. Wow, it is opposite day in this episode. 
I suppose the idea for the Pateng is kind of cool. You know, they won't eat people. They'll eat the ship that the people are on. As said, though, I don't feel any tension here because no one will shut up and let me absorb anything going on on screen. So the first Doctor person working on the ship dies, who I felt nothing for because he spent all of his space in the runtime just over-explaining shit. And his role in the story is just handed over to this lady, who flatly explains why his death is significant to her, and I feel... nothing. So empty. In fact, the best thing about this episode was all the stuff with the pregnant man. I don't know, I just found it funny because, hey, it's far in the future. Maybe biology could work this differently far in the future because it's far in the future. Who knows? Who gives a fuck? He's only been pregnant a week, and boys only give birth to boys. Oh, and the joke about the history books claiming that humans from eons ago worshipped the god avocado pear was very funny. That's about all the positive things I have to say about this episode, though. And they deliver the baby, and they explain that children are amazeballs, and they are the future. Teach them well, and let them lead the way. Maybe harping on the show don't tell complaints so much is a bit unfair of me, because it's quite obvious that Saranga Conundrum was the cheap one. Aside from the little monsters and a couple of spaceship shots, it looks and feels like a filler serial from classic Doctor Who. You know, it's a hospital setting, so that gives us an excuse to have mostly sterile blank white sets because decorating them would cost too much. So, you know, I suppose I should give them credit for a creative approach to economising. The monsters aside, all we really have to spend our money on is shoving our actors in our sets and having them babbling about how important everything is until the time's filled. You know, like that episode of The Mind Robber where they shoved Jamie and Zoe in a white void with some robots reused from a different show. And yes, I love that episode too. But, you know, some cheap episodes work, some don't. I mean, I'll give them this. At least it's not the Space Pirates. They're not in the position where they have to spread this incredibly thin shit over two and a half hours. Just imagine it. Saranga Conundrum for two and a half hours. Bloody hell, that counts as a positive to me. At least it's not the Space Pirates. What's wrong with me? Shit, maybe people are right. Maybe I am being too nice to Series 11. Okay, come here, you little bastard. <laughs> 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 